Welcome to Solar 2. Today the plan is to get some cabling running from our solar panels all the way through to our charge controller and then batteries. I want to show you how we've set up all of our breakers, fuses and how we troubleshoot our system. So we need to create a non-conductive surface that we can screw all of our charge controllers, wiring and so on to under the wheelhouse. Something fell over. Um, basically the easiest way to do this is a couple of sheets of plywood. So behind me I've got some um, two layers of half inch thick ply that I've laminated together. I'm going to clean those up, router all the edges and so on and that's going to become our non-conductive mounting surface. So we started with two layers of half inch thick plywood and uh, laminated these two together and then once, once it was all dried we cleaned it up, routed the edges and you can see that we've, um, we're left with basically a beautiful, we obviously painted it and we're left with a, a pretty basic plain flat white board. Um, it's an inch thick so it's uh, nice and thick, all of our fastenings are going to be three quarters of an inch um, or shorter so that way we're completely safe and we're not going to tap out on any metal or anything like that um, and being wood it's completely non-conductive so it's a really safe medium to start bolting all of our gear to. To give you some bearings of where we're at, so basically these are the screens in front of the helm seat. You've got your steering wheel, throttle controls, uh, helm seat just here, and then that's the entranceway up into the wheelhouse. Um, so right underneath this, where this white board is, that white board is going to be attached to the floor, underneath the floorboards here. You can see that far wall down the end there that we've just painted. Um, excuse the wiring in the way, that far wall down the end is where that board's going to be mounted. So that's where all of our charge controls and so on are going to live. So it's basically the wall goes sort of oh, right right there you can sort of see there's a, a, a piece of red steel that goes across just here. Um, that's the top of that wall um, and it's right underneath the floorboards of the wheelhouse. So I just realised that the floor and the sort of the floor of this um, battery box, basically this compartment that I'm standing in, and the floor of the wheelhouse aren't parallel, so they're on a bit of a skew up angle like this. So um, I basically have to make a choice. What am I going to line it up visually? So is it going to be visually lined to the bottom parallel or to the top parallel? So um, normally I would just go straight to the top, like assume make the top parallel, but. The bottom is the bit you're going to see, so I think I'm going to do it to the bottom, but everything in my brain is screaming go the other way, so I don't know, we'll see what ends up.
looks a hundred times better when the top's lined up. Let's go with that. So I'm going to glue this down using the same techniques that we used on the dash. Um, we're basically using a, essentially a, um, I think it's a polyurethane type um, adhesive type stuff. So um, just a bunch of really big globs of this stuff uh, and then pressed in and that's generally enough to hold it. We use this stuff for all sorts on the boat including like holding windows in and whatever so it's really really strong stuff so we don't need to put massive amounts to be able to hold just a pretty simple piece of wood up. Doesn't that have to be real pro precise where this goes? Just nice and tight up against the wall is about the only thing I need to make sure. Yeah. So when that's fully um, glued in there, I'll basically go around with a bead of sealant all the way around and then I'll throw a coat of paint over the top of the whole thing and that way I know that that board is about as watertight as I'm going to get in terms of if any condensation or anything like that ever happens in here. Um, yeah, just essentially trying to protect it from rot inside this area. The board's all glued in now, so really stoked with how that came out. Um, it's all attached in there nicely. So I've started to fit some of the parts. So this box that you can see in the corner here is our breaker box. Um, so we have these two pole positive and negative breakers, so um, just like a normal household breaker, but they work for, for DC electricity rather than AC. Um, if you haven't used one of these boxes before, they're pretty neat. This is actually, well, the second time I've actually ever used one of these, but um, they have a little DIN rail in here, and these fuses, oh, sorry, breakers clip in the bottom, so you've got this little yellow clip that you can push forward and it locks it in. Um, so let me just throw this in. Clips on like that, flick the yellow switch, and then that's basically firm in there like that. And then over top, this facade goes in. Right, it's a wee bit hard with one hand, but it holds, it's not screwed up, but it holds basically those, there's another set of breakers that go in here like this. And you can see there's this rubber, um, rubber O-ring all the way around that little gasket. When you close this down, it's lovely and neat and tidy. So that's how our breakers are gonna be sitting. Next thing out of the box is our MPPT charge controller. So this is a pretty simple unit that only does solar um, and it can do up to, I think, four kilowatts of solar um, at 48 volts. Uh, so it's based on the battery voltage, not the solar panel voltage. So up to 100 volts for the panels and 48 volts for the, um, for the battery bank. So we're gonna be mounting this in here roughly like that, just beside the, the breaker box there. The issue that I'm having, if you have a look at this, see these, these four little dots at the top here? They're M3 threaded um, into, the, into this back panel here. There's no other way of holding it on this whole thing. And if I'm just holding it at the end, there's the chance that it's gonna start doing this sort of thing at sea. So, uh, I'm actually not gonna use those mounts because I think they're garbage. Um, I've taken the green cover off this completely and opened it up thinking maybe I could screw this back panel directly into the board. Um, but there's, it's full of circuits, there's no way I'm going to be able to get anything through that, so that's out. What I'm thinking is sickering that back onto this board. Um, there's probably better ways to mount it, but I don't have a huge amount of options at this stage, so I can't screw through it. I can't use the original mounts because they're rubbish. Um, so I need to do something, um, so some sort of adhesive is what I'm thinking. So the next challenge to figure out now is where to put stuff on this board. So we've got our circuit breakers and charge controller mounted on the left hand side and I have to do our DC conversion, so 48 volts down to 12 volts. 
as well as all of our fuses and buzz bars. So now I'm just trying to work out a layout that's going to be the most um, tidiest, basically. This little thing that I'm screwing in now is our 48 to 12 volt DC DC converter. So our battery house storage is 48 volts so that we can uh, have the amount of solar that we will be eventually having so it can take up the 4 kilowatts if it's 48 volts. This little charge controller is a limiting factor so if I was running 12 volts, the whole system at 12 volts, I can only have about 800 watts of solar. I can double that if it's 240 and I can double it again if it's 48. So that's why we've wired the batteries up as a 48 volt bank so that we can have a huge amount of solar at the back and then obviously get the corresponding amount of energy. So when you start working on a boat and you're doing wiring, you want to make sure you're using tinned wire. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, tinned wire is generally um, a, a marine grade sort of wire, so they, it's, it's more often than not it's going to be a flexible wire. So household wiring is useless on a boat. Um, it's way too stiff and it starts to die after a while because of the vibration. Marine wire has uh, a lot more strands, lo lots of smaller strands, so it ends up being a hell of a lot more flexible. It doesn't die as much when it comes to vibration, but also with the tinned um, Part of it the wiring looks different so it's actually a silver color you can sort of see that as opposed to like the golden color of copper it's still copper wire but it's coated with um, i think it's solder basically when they make the wire i think they dip it through solder or something along those lines but essentially what it does is, is it stops the wire from corroding um, it'll still corrode if you don't do the ends correctly but you've got a much better chance of it lasting so that's why tin wire is always used in a marine environment so when you're doing wiring if you need to basically finish off an end of your wire and you want to put it into a, like a like basically a screw down holder like this if you can try not to just stick this straight in and basically screw it down if you can get these little things here they're called a boot lace ferrule so i can show you really close um basically what it is it's like a tube so you slide the wire down on the inside down there and then you've got the metal component at the very end here um, there you go so you've got the metal component at the very end there if you can see that it's hollow so you need a special tool looks there we go and it ratchet clamps down like that so slide the bootlace ferrule in and you hold it like so clamp that down there we go and you can see you've got three let me get it to focus again As you can see there it's got three little rings around it that it's clamped down on it. That holds the wire um, 360 degrees around and then you screw down on top of that ferrule. So you end up with a much more um, robust join, much less likely to give you any sort of jip and you actually get less resistance through the join as well from what I understand. So I need to bring the wires coming from this here um, DC DC voltage converter through to the breaker box. Um, so breaker boxes have these little round circles you can sort of see on the top there, um, and that's so you can snap things out to be the right diameter for, for cable glands or whatever it is. Cable glands I'm using are quite small, um, so I'm actually going to be drilling down the centre of those and then putting in some fairly small cable glands. Neat wiring is really good because um, it allows you to basically 
if there's a fault, it allows you to diagnose it really early. You know, if something, I don't know, something out here shorts out or does something stupid, I can really quickly follow the wire back and then all the way back to wherever the, the, the fault may be or the source may be. If you've kind of got it all just bundled together and grouped up, um, it can be very difficult to actually see what's going on. Um, so yeah, for me, wiring being neat um, is, is great for my OCD, but it's also really good for the ability to actually keep the boat really tidy and really functional going forward. Right, it's time to talk about this badass fuse I got for the batteries. So there's a few different types of fuses that you can use um, on, on your install like this. So you've got like the little 12 volt ones that you have in a car, little blade fuse. And these are okay, um, they're incredibly cheap. Um, and if they blow, they're really obvious if they're blown and they're easy to replace. So most people are pretty familiar with these. We use these types of blade fuses on our uh, 12 volt circuits. So, you know, our lights and stuff like that, stuff where it's you know not a major critical thing and we just need a, a little cheap piece of insurance. These are great for that. Next step up, circuit breakers. So this is an AC circuit breaker, but it's it's very similar to our, our DC circuit breakers. So it's basically just like what you'd have in your house, on off, um, and then also it has a certain rating that it'll it'll blow at. So uh, you know you can disconnect that circuit from from any sort of power if there's a fault. Um, the next step up, I've never used one of these before, so I'm just going to preface this. The next step up is is what I like to refer to as my badass fuse. This is what uh, our batteries are going to be basically fused by. So this is a it's a 32 amp fuse, but I'll see if I can show you. So it's rated for 32 amps. It is a um, a, it can basically do AC circuits as well as DC, but the reason why we've got this particular fuse is it's just like you know the old glass bulb fuses where you have like a wire that goes down the sort of centre of it and you've got a you know glass tube around it. It's basically that, but it's encapsulated with sand. And the reason why they have this fuse, according to the chap at the electrical shop, is that so my batteries uh, at the moment I've got uh, 800 amp hours of storage and we're going to be uh, tripling that so we're going to have a fair whack of batteries in here um, for our house bank. Um, if all of the, if something happens and all of those start feeding maximum current all at the same time down the lines and it hits one of these DC breakers it's literally going to explode. Um, it might be rated for 40 amps or you know whatever the rating might be but if it's going to get that much power in, in you know a fraction of a second, it, it doesn't have enough time to react properly and it, it'll literally explode. This here, the sand, captures that explosion. So yes, the fuse will blow, it's basically rated to the same amount. This is a 32 amp fuse, so it's rated to, to essentially the same amount as what you know your, your breaker might be. But because it's encapsulated in sand, it's basically a, like a safety surround. So that's why they have these. Um, it stops this sort of thing exploding, causing a fire in your battery bay right where you don't want it. This basically takes the brunt of that impact. So in order to get the cable run from the back of the lounge up the top here, all the way around the wall and over to where Ryan is in the doorway there, all the charge controller and everything is behind that wall. So we need to basically make a safe um, method of getting that cable and also that power forward. So we're gonna be using conduit. I'm gonna show you what we're doing. So the power comes in through these two glands here, so positive and negative, and it goes into those two holes, so the glands come through those holes. It then works its way down that hole, all the way along this conduit to the corner. We've got a corner piece that we can unbolt on the side here, so if we ever need to get in there or we feed the, you know, feed the cabling through, we can easily access that. We're then going to run the conduit all the way along this main beam, right the way forward. And Ryan is basically putting in a gland, so... Dropping my tools. <laughs> <laughs> Dropping the tools. So you can see here in that corner there, we've marked out where a gland needs to go. Um, I'll show you what that actually is. So it's, it's similar to a cable gland, except in this case it's a conduit gland. Basically, um, we take this black nut all the way off, get it off, we push that through the steel wall and then screw this back up. And what that allows is, is essentially a smooth en entry and exit point for the, um, the cable to go through. So this conduit then is held fast against the steel wall. For the spark 
Sharky's on the channel. Um, the cable run that we're doing with our solar, Ryan's just hooking up the conduit and everything now so we can run the cables. We're going to be using 8mm squared um, tin cable. Uh, so I've got a, a two separate runs, a black and a red, positive and negative obviously. Um, the specs, I think, I think I could probably get away with less in terms of cable thickness, like conductor size and so on. Um, I've got 72 volts DC running a maximum of 32 amps. Um, that's at absolute full whack. I don't think I'll get that most of the time, but at full whack, that's what it is. Um, and the specs say that I can get away with four millimeters squared, but to me that seemed a bit small, so I've, I've basically doubled it. Um, the cable run is about eight meters long, um, so it's it's not a huge cable run, um, but I've yeah just in, just so that I can give it the best chance of having the least voltage voltage drop. Um, I'm basically using cable, which I think is probably overrated. So a friend of mine recently told me that she wires up all of her computer systems to be NASA spec. Um, so the competitive side of me basically said, okay, challenge accepted. So that's my goal for all of this. So we're starting to get a power board that's looking a bit sort of tidier. We've moved the batteries over into the corner, so there's a lot of stuff sitting on top just so that I could vacuum out the floor. But that's where the batteries will stay. We haven't made the mounts yet, we're going to make them shortly and we're going to start isolating these as well by putting them in their own box. But for now that's basically where they're going to sit, so we'll start running the cabling and so on across to this power board. A really critical thing to do when you're setting your solar system up is to determine how much power you're going to use on your boat or your house or your shed or whatever it is that you're powering. So when it comes to battery storage, there's a couple of ways to set that up and it all comes back to how, how much power you need to store. So um, these batteries will hold 800 amp hours. So each battery is two, 12 volt, 200 amps. So they'll hold, in theory, 800 amp hours between them if we set them up as a 12 volt system. The reason why we're not setting them up as a 12 volt system is because we need quite a bit of power and by moving to a higher voltage, we can actually go down in cable size and keep the cost manageable. We can also put more solar into the system because it all comes back to amps. If we were to set this up as a 12 volt system, um, we'd say, let, just I'll pull some round numbers out. Let's say it's 12 volts, it might be 60 amps for argument's sake. If we go down to, uh, if we double the voltage to 24 volts, it'll come down to 30 amps. And then if we double it again, go to 48 volts, it'll come down to 15 amps. So amps determine the size of your cables. As a bit of a generalization, amps determine the size of your cables. So the bigger the voltage, the less your amperage will be oftentimes when you're working with DC. So for us, we're setting it up as a 48 volt system. So I'm gonna show you how to wire the batteries up to be that. So one thing I learned um, about soldering when, um, when I did the first solar episode, and this is something Richard told me and I forgot when he came over last time, when you join your wires, rather than twist them, you want to leave them straight like that, untwisted, and then you mash them together so that they become like a mechanical join, if that makes sense. And then the solder is simply to stop them from, become, from, from coming apart. If you twist them together and sit them like I did last time, they don't get as good a join, um, and theoretically you can create a heat spot. So, I just did one, I'm going to have another go, do it again. So press them together and you can feel them physically mash in towards each other and then that connector needs to go, the solder needs to go right over top of the two. So, so that's resin and that's resin and then that is low melt solder. So the two wires are mashed together so all of the strands are mashed like that and now the solder is going to join them together and then the heat shrink is going to seal off both ends. So you can see our batteries now um, joined up, so we've got the three loops, so 12, 24, 36, 48, and then we've got our main power positive and our main power negative coming off these batteries. So right now these batteries are now creating a 48 volt um, output as opposed to a 12 volt output. So on each of these main cable joins, where I've got my main 48 volt positive and negative, I've got one of these um, low melt, low temp melt solder thingy majackies. Um, I really like these, I think they're quite neat. Um, we'll obviously see how they go over time, but so far I think they've been pretty good. 
Um, so I'm putting one of those in, mashing the wires together um, like I was told to, and then I'm also putting a bit of heat shrink over top just, just to be absolutely certain and just to protect them. Okay, so the batteries are hooked together now. Um, they're sort of in big loops, etc. And there is, it looks a bit messy, but there's some method to my thinking. Um, basically, I've given myself extra room. So these batteries don't have terminals like a normal battery. It's basically cable set into, a, into a, like a resin. I didn't know that when I ordered these batteries, so I imported these myself. Um, and they came like that, and I was a bit disappointed because I think these cables are too small overall. Um, but I can't do anything about that. So I've left myself a bit of extra room. If I have to, I can cut these down probably a couple of times before I start running out of room. Um, and it gives it a bit of flexibility. I don't want to have this coming into a hard bend or anything like this. So that's why I've done it the way I have. I've also given myself quite a bit of, um, I've, I've put a couple of loops in this system. So I've got quite a bit of extra at this end if I ever need to cut that down. And then we've just stapled it down to the wall all the way along and then back up the side and over to the charge controller. So when we put the fuse in, charge controller goes live. Against this wall here, this is where, um, this is the back of our kitchen um, and the front face of our wheelhouse wall. Um, so above me, pretty much directly, is the steering wheel and I'm straight down under the floorboards and this is the, the face. What I've got to do is run some cables along this wall and these um, power some of the internal 12 volt circuits. So I've got, it's a bit hard to show you, I've got some of this D clippy stuff, so basically it's like a conduit holder um, with a clip when it's all clipped together, like like so. It just sits against the wall. It's a really nice, neat, tidy way of um, basically keeping our cables in order around the wall. So I've just joined this um, negative cable. This is one of the ones that feeds the lights inside the cabin. Um, I really hate using these joiners. Um, so anyway, I've crimped it. It's the only joiner I have. I've crimped it. And what I like to do is chuck a bit of uh, 10 mil heat shrink over top. Let's see if I can get this on one-handed. So it's a um, it's a six mil conductor, six mil squared conductor. So it's quite big. It's only got a couple of LED lights that hang off the end, so there's bugger all power draw on it. But I just um, like to seal them up like that, so there's just no way that we can have any silly business when it comes to our co our um, connections. All right, so now that Ryan's got the conduit mounted, you can see it's like really nicely um, fastened up there all the way along. Um, we're going to go through now and put the uh, start running the cabling through. So it's a long story, but we only have half of the cabling that we need. Um, the shop in town wasn't open when they told us they were going to be. So we're going to run the negative cable all the way through and connect that up, and then we'll run the positive cable um, in two days' time when we can get to the shop that sells it. So we started putting in this polystyrene so that we can guide our wires down through the wall but we realised that on the wall um, it's going to be really difficult to actually feed the cabling through under the floorboards so we decided to, well actually Ryan came up with a bloody brilliant idea, bypass the floorboards, come in beside and behind the box. So to do that we're going to route some new tracks on this polystyrene and guide the wire into a different location um, and then we'll show you how that all fits in. Ryan's up at the moment uh, drilling the uh, hole saw for a gland um, so we're going to feed everything through a gland through the steel. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to turn out way better than what I originally was planning. You can see our conduit working its way all the way down this beam. We've got, uh, this is the negative, this is an 8mm squared negative that basically runs from that conduit all the way along. And we've got it mounted into the actual polystyrene, um, just because it's the easiest way we can mount it. We've got it going through a cable gland. So we're going to be having a, uh, a duplicate of that cable, a red uh, positive. Um, just waiting for the shop to open so that we can get that done. Uh, and then get the solar charging into the batteries. All right, so now that we've got our positive and negatives hooked up in there, um, there's plenty of spare cable sort of coiled up in the background just in case we ever have to shorten anything up. Um, time to put the lid on this. The cabling for 50% of the solar, so this one side of solar runs through all the way down the conduit that uh, Ryan put in and then goes right through into our charge controller so we're actually getting charged down from these solar panels now. So the charge controller that we're using is called a Solar Eagle. Um, it's a pretty basic charge controller so we don't get a huge amount more information other than what you can sort of see on the front here. It's hooked with a USB cable so I'm just waiting for the, the communication to start coming through. Here we go. Should have some numbers. There we, yeah, cool, right numbers. So you can see the in the graphic at the top, you can see the solar panels are feeding through the DC converter, charge controller, and then into the batteries. There's nothing coming down the load 
channel here um, we've got the load turned off as the batteries are really low currently the panels are creating 60 65.7 volts and uh, the temperature is saying 39 degrees but that's um, a dud reading as there's no temperature probe um, the batteries you can see are quite low they're 45.4 volts that should be well over sort of 50 volts um, and we've got a very very overcast day at the moment so that's partly why they're so low we've only got 18 watts of power coming through through the whole array of uh, panels um, and the amps are, are correspondingly quite low so 0.4 of an amp one of the issues we are having is we can't seem to get the amps to come up high we should be getting up about 14 amps when the sun hits these panels um, so we need to do a bit of fine tuning and troubleshooting as to as to why the pet the amperage is so low none of the cabling is getting hot we think the problem is up at the at the panel um, we've got gel batteries so you can modify some of the settings at the back here um, there's not a huge amount to play with um, but this is yeah I suppose where you get the bulk of your information from so the panels are now wired in um, next step is actually going through and doing a bit of a fine tune um, so we're not getting as much amp come, uh, amperage come through as what we were expecting um, so the plan is now is to now that everything's hooked up we've gone through and we've double checked all the wiring um, we're not getting any voltage drop um, we're really happy with all of that um, and uh, essentially the voltage in the panels is, is all testing up okay the only thing that's not sort of coming out the way that we anticipated it would was amps so we need to go through and figure out why we've got low amps at the panels um, and we're actually thinking it may even be a problem at the panel um, so the, the thing that just doesn't make sense though is that the panels are all even so if it's a fault at the panel it's the same fault that's across all of them um, which to me sounds pretty unlikely so I need to do a bit more digging it's going to be a process of elimination just to figure out what what it is that's causing low amps um, I'm sure there's guys out there that you know feel free if you know you've come across this before you know let us know in the comments um, chuck us some areas down to to try and check and test we'll probably do an update about this in the next episode and just sort of see what we found um, but other than that it's uh, it's all in we get charge going through into the batteries and we're um, pretty happy with how it all turned out okay. Jess fed us biscuits yeah. You've been a god biscuit, huh? Tea? Clear. All clear. All right, we're yep. ready to go. Yeah, okay, you do one. You got okay. ten seconds. Go. <laughs> dun, 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 Pressure's dun, on. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> do -do -do. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. No, That's you're fired. More succinct and higher energy. <sighs> ten percent increase in energy, <laughs> as measured on the the energy rometers. As you can probably tell, yeah. Damon. Spiffing mood today. Spiffing. <laughs> this hit there. Okay. Last time you saw us bolt the. Thank you. <laughs> so the solar panels are all bolted to the roof now, and the wiring was run from from the top of the roof to the underside of the roof. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Shut up. <laughs> You've ruined that. God, you're annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have a large amount of goldfish. That felt so wrong. Yeah, okay. Just wrong on so many levels. Ah, uh, three. Welcome to Solar 2. So today the plan is is basically just gonna do this. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Solar 2. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yuck! Go that way a bit. <laughs> <laughs> 